Okay, everybody. Thanks for coming. I'm Robin Wallace. I'm the old guy. You're probably all sitting around saying, why is he telling me about ID Core? ID Core means nothing to me because I'm going to be on the CDT, and why is he telling me about uh, tanks, and why am I going to tell you about the landscape? It's very straightforward. The landscape in its entirety is a resource that you will come to exploit and depend upon, whether you go to Strathclyde or you come to Edinburgh. Everything that we have to say about what's out there is something that you will interact with in the course of your PhD to enrich and reinforce and make even better what you do. So Marcus has asked me to talk about the research landscape uh, kind of on and off campus. I have no movies to keep it into 10 minutes if I can. That's the landscape. So there's a few factoids in there. Uh, for the time being, uh, the rest of the world acknowledges that the UK is actually in the lead in terms of research, innovation, demonstration and deployment. And Tony Lewis corrected my factuous statements that we have uh, deployed more wave and tidal uh, technologies than the rest of the world put together. Uh, in fact, we've demonstrated and then taken out lots of wave technologies, but we still currently have demonstrated more wave and deployed more tidal than the rest of the world put together. We've got probably the best joined up supply chain and it's absolutely the case that through uh, the UK Centre for Marine Energy Research that David and I lead ID Corps, that he's the boss of, and the CDTs that we jointly operate with Strathclyde and around the place. The sector is actually training more PhD and NGD students for the international worldwide sector than any other country in the world. So you are part of an elite and very, very technology and sector critical uh, community. And that's why we want you to understand at least a snapshot of the landscape and where we and you fit into that. Now, first thing to say about the landscape is that you know, if you think of the technology innovation curve from uh, tech, the very low technology readiness levels to the uh, highest technology readiness levels at uh, mark full market pool, full readiness for deployment, full market pen penetration. Uh, there's different stages from research through development, demonstration, deployment. Innovation is probably somewhere in there where you innovate on stuff as it emerges to make it better and as your experience grows. And if you get it right, as the volume of deployment increases then through uh, learning by doing and uh, volume cost reduction, you start to see the unit costs and the levelised costs of energy dropping and that helps penetrate the market further. But it's a relay race. It's a relay race where most of the ideas begin either in or with the assistance of the universities, uh, pass on out through the test houses and through some of the uh, translation agencies, on out into single and multi multiple deployments at sea, places like EMEC around the world uh, and to the stage where government can support the fuller deployment. But in any good baton race, the key is not to drop the baton. So at each of the translations and size and scale of the technology, it's critical that there is joined up activity and joined up thinking. There are two uh, opportunities for uh, failure in there. You've all probably heard of the valley of death. That is where a technology gets so far and runs out of money and nobody's going to give it any more. Uh, and that's, there are lots of technologies lying in the bottom of that valley. The other one is the muddle in the middle, where everybody supposes that somebody else is going to come up with the money. Dad, can I go out to play? Well, what did your mum say? She said it's okay if it's okay with you. Hmm. Mum, can I go out to play? What did your dad say? He says it's okay with him if it's okay with you. No decision. So it's critical in this landscape that there is rather greater coherence and the coherence is slowly emerging from what has been a friggin muddle. A cluttered landscape with everybody elbowing each other in the face, competing rather than collaborating. And if there's one mantra that's come out since 2003 in this business, that competition is fantastic, it's healthy, collaboration is absolutely essential. 15 years ago, 20 years ago, Jim McDonald and I were the best of friends and all we did was meet for a beer and complain about life. Now, through the allegiance and the alliances that we've created, 
between Edinburgh and Strathclyde, between the Scottish Universities and the Energy Technology Partnership, and through the kind of collaborative processes that exist, people are working together. And the volume of consequent funding that that's generated in every primary investment is generally three or four times because the return on the investment is higher. So I'm going to tell you about some of these collaborations, uh, at least just those that are fresh off the bat. There's some, some old news here and there's some new news here, but I'm not going to go over the history of this thing, the Supergen UK Centre for Marine Energy Research. That's been going since 2003, and this university, me, Marcus, David, Ian Bryden, various folks have uh, helped to uh, move that along and through its journey. It has just been uh, extended from this October for another two years. It inevitably includes the University of Edinburgh and Strathclyde and Exeter. So you can see a bit of a pattern emerging here. But it also includes other universities who bring important capacity to address the challenges that you see in these work packages. These work packages are not chosen at random. They're on the back of foresighting, critical appraisal uh, of the needs, the technology innovation needs assessments. They're on the back of uh, a lot of road mapping and priority determination. Uh, I'm not going to go into each of these in turn, but there's another cute trick that the research councils play, and that is that while we have all of these kind of core universities in there at the outset, um, they fund through a process called Grand Challenges, Grand Challenge Projects, uh, additional universities to make uh, bespoke proposals into specific uh, areas of scientific and technological curiosity that fit, most times, with the ambitions of the work packages. So far, there have been four projects awarded uh, to the University of Edinburgh, as it happens, to Cardiff uh, and to, that's gone completely out of my head, Swansea. Um, another four projects awarded there. Vinky, put your hand up. Vinky, 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 where are you? There's Vinky. Marcus has got one. Um, there will be more. And these are a route by which we introduce diversity and additional uh, fantastic collaborative effort. So it needs to be organised into something that's going to work. And that's the kind of orbital diagram that sort of says to us what it's about. Um, at its broadest, in the third phase of this gig, there were 15 Grand Challenge projects involving another 20-some UK universities joined. We were probably the biggest academic collaboration in this area in the world. And that's brilliant. It was a fantastic experience and many of the Grand Challenge partners are still heavily involved with what we do. So let's take each of these lobes in turn and say why we need them. Academic international policy and industry networks. Well, no matter how good the technology is, it ain't going to happen on its own. It needs a conducive policy environment. It needs uh, industry engagement and support. And I don't say that in a patronising sense. Industry now owns at least 50% of the uh, pride and ambition in making this work. That's kind of where this sector's at. There's still a lot of research to be done, but it has to evolve as the journey continues. And we ain't going to do it on our own, so we need to have other academics and international partners involved. And I'm not going to take you through each of the networks. I'm just going to get to that in a second when I've done the flexible funding bit. This is where everybody stops eating and starts writing around my colleagues. The model in the research councils these days is that you get a certain amount of core funding and you say, yippee, yum, yum, we'll have that. And they say, yes, but within your total budget, you must also have a flexible fund which you must share with the community. You have to become a mini Swindon. So in this refund that we have here and in the, the, the networks refund that Strathclyde is also part of, there is a flex program where people will be called to bid in competitively to propose programs of work that align with what we do and they will get the money from us and they will become partners in UKCMA. 
And that's part of the landscape you need to be aware of. Because your supervisor, whether they have a G or an EH postcode, will be able to bid into this. And to help them be successful, one of the rules that David and I have introduced is that no existing CI in the project can apply. But colleagues within the university here and in Strathclyde can. So it's not an opportunity for us to recirculate money to ourselves. It's an opportunity for us to include others in the core and every other university in the UK. Wave Energy Scotland have uh, match funded, so that increases the pot. And we are also going to make available, uh, cunningly, uh, a process by which you don't bid for money, you bid for tank time. And you get free access to Flowwave with the support that that implies in a specific testing campaign that assists you and lines up with what we're trying to do. Here's the thing I'm not going to go into for obvious reasons. There's no time to go through that other than to say, look at the depth and the breadth and the volume of policy engagement which we and Strathclyde enjoy, the industry engagement that we have, and the one critical thing which I forgot to mention the way through is that the fourth version of this animal now also includes floating offshore wind. We have been charged by the research councils to take floating offshore wind into our remit, which is why we're now working ever more closely with Naomi at Strathclyde and with Cranfield. Some fantastic folks to work with there. <coughs> then the academic network. Now, it's implicit that the UK guys are in there. But this is a global challenge, and there's lots of other countries gearing up to work in this area, and it would be perverse if we didn't share at least some of what we already know and share our ambitions and efforts. So you can see the sort of countries that we're working with in there. Chile, Mexico, Japan, China, India, the US, uh, Canada, um, across the piece. That's really quite important for you guys because it says that you're also articulated to a worldwide community, not just what happens at King's Buildings or in Royal College. Uh, yep, let's move on. And this is the newest news. This news is new on Monday this week. Um, the research councils have chosen to fund three centres for advanced materials in the energy space. Um, one in Cambridge, one in St Andrews, and one in Edinburgh. And the pitch that we made was advanced materials for renewable energy generation. And one of our CIs in here makes a brilliant one-liner. You know, it's a single slide that says, in my day, blank. And he goes on to say, in my day, the adventure was at the centre of the discipline. However, I'm now 20 years older, and now the adventure, adventure is at the intersection of the disciplines. So this was cast very deliberately to use the materials capacity that we have across three institutes in the school, with chemistry, with Cranfield, and with Strathclyde, to say what happens if you introduce next generation semiconductor technology into next generation composites? Could we ever have real time active strain monitoring across the complete surface of a tidal blade, tidal turbine blade? What happens if we can make the blades flex intelligently? Whoa. What happens if we can make moorings respond intelligently? <coughs> How do we get to the high temperatures necessary for the storage that Alan Robinson's doing? How do we stop stuff growing as it will on materials in the sea? And these will be, and this will, the, the reason I'm telling you about this is because this will play out at Strathclyde and at Edinburgh during the time you're studying for your PhD. And these are going to be short, high adventure investments that we will make. And my CIs in here don't know it yet. But the last quarterly payment on the Keystone project that they engage in will not be released until the proposal that has arisen from the research is submitted. 
because we want to generate gearing on the investment that we will make in the initial adventure. And I expect at least four of these to fail, to be so, so off the wall that people are going to come back and say, well, shit, you know, that just didn't work. But you know, that's what the research council liked, the adventure. If there's no failure, it's not adventure enough, adventurous enough. So that's going to be on the go as of this October, and so are you. And in the community, whether you're here or in the West, in the community that you're part of, there's going to be an incredible richness of new things happening out of that that you can interact with that will assist you in what you do. And that's the old guy finished. Well, thank you. <laughs>